Well, hello there, Permission Nation. My name is Charles Specht. I'm the host here of Millionaire Insurance Producer Podcast, and it is great to be with you today. I want to talk to you today in this particular episode about something that is what I really kind of teach most of my insurance agents and agencies um, for the last 10 years is what I teach now, and it is a seven-part framework for building your book of business to a million dollars or more. This really is a seven-step process, if you will, on building your book of business to a million dollars or more, how to become a millionaire insurance producer. And let me just say, for all of you loyal listeners out there, you might already have this, but I want to talk to the rest of you who haven't yet actually gotten a free copy of my book. I actually wrote a book. It's called The Millionaire Insurance Producer, The Millionaire Producer, and the subtitle of the book is Seven Steps to the Fastest, Smartest, Most Ethical Approach to Building a $1 Million or More Book of Business. That's what I'm going to be talking about today, and you can actually go to my website, download a free copy of the book itself, and so you can read it uh, at at your leisure. Go to www.millionaireinsuranceproducer.com www.millionaireinsuranceproducer.com. You'll go ahead and put in your email address. It will be emailed to you, and you're going to have right at your fingertips the seven steps to the fastest, smartest, most ethical approach to building a $1 million or more book of business. And so there are seven things, count them up, seven things that I'm going to tell you right now that if you do these things, you are much more likely to have success selling insurance going to win more clients, you're going to save so much time, you're going to have so much more joy, and you won't have to worry about being chosen because you have already have been chosen. So seven steps. Here's the first one. Collect signatures and serve happiness. Collect signatures and serve happiness. All right, so I am actually known for, for my curriculum that surrounds the broker of record letter. Brokerofrecordletter.com. I actually have a, a site there that is forwarding to the 12X Mastermind. Brokerofrecordletter.com. You can go there as well. But really, the focus is on collecting signatures and serving happiness. When it comes down to the insurance business, what are you doing as an advisor? What are you doing as an insurance producer? What really is the goal? Have you ever thought about that? No, seriously, have you ever thought about that? What exactly are you doing? What exactly are you doing every single day that you come into the office or that you pick up a telephone? Do you have it? Just out of curiosity, do you have a goal for prospecting? Do you have a goal for doing cold calls? What exactly is the reason that you're doing cold calls? Well, it might be to actually set the appointment. That's the goal. There has to be a goal, a reason for everything. Why exactly are you in the insurance business? Is it to sling mud and to offer quotes? No, that's not what you're here for. Please, that's not what you're here for. Insurance underwriters on the carrier level offer quotes. Surplus lines agents offer quotes. What you do as an independent agent on the retail side is that you collect signatures and serve happiness. That's what you do. You collect signatures. We have to collect signatures on a lot of important documents. We have to collect signatures on a loss run authorization letter, for example. We have to collect signatures on a bind order. We have to collect signatures on a finance agreement. We have to collect signatures on different things. One of the most important, most um, expensive pieces of paper out there in the insurance business is a signed broker of record letter. It is money. And so when you actually collect a signature on a broker of record letter, listen to me, you have one you have won. You are victorious. You have a trophy. Hold that thing up. You got a trophy. You got a signature on a piece of paper. So you, as an insurance agent, this is the first thing. Please listen to me. This is the first thing. You collect signatures. You collect signatures. That's what you do. And when you collect signatures, after you have collected those signatures, you serve. You serve. You provide services. You collect signatures and serve happiness. That's what we do. Our, our clients need to be happy. They want to, they want to be joyful. They want to be satisfied. They would like to stay loyal. They want to be happy that they chose you. And so we have to provide services that provide solutions to the bigger problems that they have. You do that, your client will remain happy. A happy client is a loyal client. A loyal client puts money in your pocket. 
So as a retail agent, as you're building your book of business to a million dollars or more, step one in the process of becoming that millionaire insurance producer is to collect signatures and serve happiness. How are you doing with that? How are you doing with collecting signatures and serving happiness? You know, if you are not having a lot of joy in the industry, you're probably not serving a whole lot of happiness. Uh, some agencies struggle at joy. Some agencies struggle at serving happiness. Their, their problem is your opportunity. You don't have to provide a lot of different services. You just have to provide services that your clients actually want and need. You know, I see this on the employee health benefit side a lot. You know, they will provide certain um, tech services, offerings, and so forth. And there are a lot of great things. I mean, there's a, a lot of amazing things that are available in these tech platforms that they could offer to their clients. But the problem is that your client just doesn't have time to mess around with that. They don't want to learn new tech. They don't want to dive in there and kind of figure it all out. That's what they hire you for. They're busy doing their own their own business. And so they don't want to mess around necessarily and go and fi figure out new tech about how to find certain things. That's why they hire you. And so you need to collect signatures and serve happiness. You don't collect signatures and serve headaches. You don't collect signatures and serve tech. You serve the insured. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that, look, you're licensed for permission. You're not licensed for sales. You got your insurance license. You went through the continuing education process, or rather the, uh, the pre-licensing education process. You took the test. You passed it. <laughs> applause to you. You are now a licensed insurance agent. You get an opportunity to do a lot of different things. And after all is said and done, you are licensed for persuasion. You're not licensed for sales. Yes, we have to sell. We actually have to provide something that they want to buy. If you want to call that sales, great. I actually refer to it more as persuasion. We have to persuade because many times, the insured doesn't know exactly what they want or someone is telling them, quite likely the incumbent agent, someone is telling them to do something other than what we are actually advising them to do, right? Someone else, the incumbent agent, other agents, people that they've known before, they have to be persuaded to do what we want them to do. I have a client who is right now targeting captives, Targeting group captives. I think he's going to be awesome. I think he's going to be amazing at it. I think he is, frankly, going to write a ton of business. One of the problems, however, is that there's a lot of agents out there who have sort of um, looked bad or down upon captives, and they have been advising, oh, their clients, oh, don't ever even think about one of those. Oh, you're going to have you know, joint and several liability. I mean, they're saying things that aren't even true. They're saying things they don't know about. Oh, you're going to have joint and several liability. Oh, that thing's going to blow up. Oh, yeah. And so then times the insured is nervous um, about it. And so sometimes you have to actually persuade them about why this actually makes sense for them. You're in the persuasion business. You're not in the insurance business. You're in the service business. You're not in the insurance business. You're in this persuasion business. You're not necessarily a salesperson. You are somebody who advises them. You advise them on risk management strategies. You advise them on how to eliminate exposure so that they don't have to worry about a peril. That's what you do. Eliminate an exposure that's going to cause an actual claim. That's the first part of what you do. You persuade people to actually do that. If they have a problem in their premises for trip and fall, if people are falling down, get the boxes out of the way. Remove the ex exposure. Eliminate the issue. That's the first part of loss control. That's the first part of risk management. Just start looking at all the various places in the, your insured's business or your client's business that there is a potential for loss and try to eliminate as many exposures as possible. Not only is it going to make their their business potentially more profitable, certainly more safe, but the underwriter is going to love it and they're going to give you probably a discounts on your rates because of it. So you are advising them to do that. And then you're advising them to purchase certain insurance policies to cover that. Um, I am hearing so many ugly, terrible, nasty stories out there right now in regards to cyber liability claims. It actually, it makes me feel bad. 
I'm telling you, I am so, I'm nervous about this. I'm, I'm nervous about where the world is going right now uh, because all of these different hackers are coming in and holding companies ransom, all their information ransom, and you have to pay significant hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars just to get your data back. And who's to say that once they deposit that, they're not going to do it again? I mean, I really think this is going to be a huge issue. I was talking to some clients, and some of their particular clients have now have been hacked, and the insurance carrier you know, is talking to them about this ransom and trying to negotiate, and how quickly do you need your information? Can you wait a month? What do you mean, can I wait a month? It's amazing what is happening out there right now with these hackers. Cyber liability, you know what? If you haven't been able to persuade them in the past, you better start figuring it out quick. Quick. Sometimes our insurers need to be persuaded to actually do something. Look, workers' compensation or auto liability, for example, you know, if they have employees or you know, they are, have vehicles on the road, they have to purchase that insurance by law. That's an easier sell. They don't have to buy cyber liability. It's not required. You definitely better have better persuasion skills when it comes to that. But then also, how about like limits? You have to persuade them on limits. Somebody wants to you know, purchase only you know, $100,000 of liability you know, for something. Well, you know, you're probably going to need a whole lot more than that. You know, are you a construction you know, subcontractor that's doing $7 million of annual gross sales you know, each and every year, but you only have a $2 million general aggregate and a $1 million um, occurrence? Limit on your policy, but you don't have an umbrella? Uh, do you like gambling? Is that what you do? You like gambling with your career. They need to be persuaded to actually do something. So that's what you are. You're not necessarily a salesperson. You are a persuader. You need to work then on your persuasion. As you work on your persuasion, your tact, your delivery, how you actually message things, you're going to see your book of business actually increase significantly. So the third thing now is think bigger. 12x. Think bigger. Stop thinking small. I was working with a brand new insurance agent. Um, his name is Matt. Matt, if you're listening, what's up, Matt? Good to, good to have you listening here. Matt is a new insurance producer. has been in the business for about a year. Like most insurance agents who are brand new and start out, they, uh, they tend to just kind of go after and write whatever they can. My always hope and goal is that they will work on a big account, and even if they don't get it, they worked on such a huge, significant account that they began to smell the commission. They could smell how much more the commission was than all the little tiny accounts that they were working on, right? So your average new producer is probably working on stuff that's going to generate $500 of commission or 1000 or maybe $1,500 or 2000 I want them to kind of get a feel for what it's like to work on something that's forty dollars or $50,000 of commission. And I hope they get it. But even if they don't get it, man, they have they, they begun to like think about what it would have been like to win what maybe they could have spent that money on to buy for themselves or their family, whatever it was. And then once they see that, that bigger opportunity, then the small accounts start to look loathsome. And that's a beautiful thing. Think bigger. Matt started working on um, different types of habitational, different types of habitational. He ended up getting a very large hotel account. This is awesome. Got a very large hotel account and then just decided I'm not going after small accounts anymore. I'm not going after small accounts anymore. Wrote a significant account, decided to no longer go after these small things, and at a very sizable agency, ended up being rookie of the year. It's amazing what happens when you start going after larger accounts. So think bigger, 12x. If you're going after stuff that is $1,000 of total commission, start going after stuff that's twelve grand. Just 12x that thing. You know, if you're going after stuff that's $10,000, hey, why not make it fifty? Right? Why not? Why not just go big? Why not? You don't have to write 17 accounts in a year you know, at that size to have a really good year. You just have to get a few. That's it. And as you're continuing to prospect, you're probably going to, get, you're going to get a significant number. You're just going to end up writing a whole lot more business in the long run. You're probably going to be more joyful about it as well. Think bigger, 12X. The fourth thing here, in order to become a millionaire insurance producer, remember said www.millionaireinsuranceproducer.com, the fourth step to building your book of business is to stop offering quotes to non-clients. This is the hardest thing, I think, for an insurance 
agent or producer to begin understanding and to do, to just stop offering cl- uh, quotes to non-clients. Uh, because we have, uh, we have taught ourselves that this is what insurance agents do. We offer quotes. We have, we have conditioned our minds. We have conditioned the insured to think this is what has to happen. We have to get quotes. But you don't have to offer quotes. I actually, as I've mentioned before, I believe that it is quasi-unethical to actually do that. You muddy up the waters for the insured to get really good quotes if you are offering quotes without really having any kind of permission. And I say quotes because it's just going through the quoting process. You might not get any quotes. You just you might get blocked out everywhere. But what you did is you offered multiple submissions to a carrier. Now the carrier underwriter is less interested in actually working on the account because the underwriter wants to work with whoever controls the business. And you're just in there muddying it up. And so the underwriter now thinks, oh, gosh, this person, this insured, this, this, this uh, insured is only concerned about money. They're not concerned about loyalty. They don't want a long-term play here. I'm going to move on to the next thing. Therefore, you have hindered the insured's ability to get a quote, let alone a good quote. Therefore, I think it's unethical. I think it is unethical. It doesn't serve you. It doesn't serve your underwriter. It doesn't serve the insured. You can offer quotes. Nothing wrong with quotes. I like quotes. Quotes are good. Underwriters have to offer quotes. That's what they get paid for. Surplus lines have to go to the market and help us get quotes. You can present what you what you uh, receive, but what you do is collect signatures and serve happiness. That's what an insurance agent does. Collect signatures, serve happiness. Stop offering quotes to people who have not yet given you their permission to represent you in the marketplace. That's not what pros do. Stop offering quotes to nine clients. The fifth one. The riches are in the micro niches, right? The riches are in the micro niches. People who are generalists tend to not make as much money in, in selling insurance. People who are very much micro-niched focus on one, maybe two different industries, and they are, prof- they are professionals at it, are the ones who win more accounts. They, have to qu- they don't have to quote much. They quote less often. They are awarded the signed broker of record letter, and they are given exclusivity to represent the insured in the marketplace. Why? Because they understand that particular industry. They understand the exposures. They have created services and potentially even products that are specific to that industry. Okay? I'm going to talk about products here in a little bit, uh, but it is amazing what you can do when you provide niche-based services to your clients. Right? So the riches are in the micro niches. And by micro niche... I mean going smaller, if you will, or rather just narrowing your focus down. It's, you know, it's like kind of looking through binoculars and you see something out into the distance. You know, you can use, you can use the lens to do that. Um, but if you want to actually look at something really closely, you have to look into a microscope. You have to really get focused down on it, right? Um, and if you take, for example, maybe even a magnifying glass and you use it at the right angle with the sun, I mean, you can take all of that and condense the energy down into one point and even set something on fire. That's what I want you to do. I want you to go small. I want you to think small, particularly in an industry, and set that thing on fire. I want you to get ignited. I want you to burn. I want you to write business. And what I mean by this is, as an example, the construction industry is just that. It is a construction industry. There are so many different things. There are general contractors. There are subcontractors. Those are two completely different types of insurance policies, two completely different types of businesses. There are residential exposures for for uh, companies that are doing homes and track developments and luxury homes. And there is multi-use. That are, there is uh, retail space on the bottom. There are apartments or condos above that. There's industrial. There's just so many different types of construction. But just as a just as a, maybe an, an E and O protection, if you as an insurance agent are writing insurance for subcontractors, do not listen to listen very carefully. Do not write insurance for general contractors. If you are writing subcontractor insurance, you better make sure you do not have a general contractor who is um, who is the general for one of the subs. Because you will not, there is simply no way you can do the best interest for your client without hindering what your other client needs, right? If you if you're writing the general contractor, um, you write their insurance. You got to get. You're trying to basically, if I can say it this way, you're trying to stick it to the sub, 
right? Contractually, got to have the right limits. You're asking for the sun, moon, and stars, personal guarantees, all that kind of stuff. Well, that really doesn't help the subcontractor. So if you are also the insurance agent for the subcontractor, you better get sued. You should. You should get sued because you do not have their best interests involved in mind. So look, it's a micro niche. Do one or the other. You can't do both. There's just too many different exposures and all the different things like their health care. There's physician groups, there's hospitals, there's urgent cares. Focus on a micro niche. Go, just make it narrow. Let that be your focus. You will win more business. You will write more business. You will write more profitable business. And the larger, you will have larger accounts that do business with you. So the riches are in the micro niche niches, micro niche. Finally, or rather, the the next one here is number six, fee-based products. Yeah, I mean, you can get paid on the, for the um, insurance policies that you place. Good. That's great. Um, There's a few different ways to actually increase your revenue, both potentially as an insurance agent and certainly as an agency. So all agency principals, listen up. Turn up the volume. Please listen to me. There are other ways that you can create income in your agency other than just having you or an insurance agency place a policy. Now, this isn't a blanket statement. Got to check the guidelines for every state that you're in, what you can do, what you can't do, if you can do broker fees, if you can't do broker fees, if you're allowed to do certain things. So don't take this as a blanket statement. You got to actually check what you can and can't do in your various state and jurisdiction. Okay. But um, there's a lot of different things you can do besides an insurance policy. You can write, for example, you can write the insurance for restaurants and actually get paid by the carrier for that. What are they going to pay you? I don't know, 15%. Um, here's the first way in which to increase your revenue. It is amazing what you get when you ask for the sale. Hashtag ask for the sale. What I mean by that is you always need to be asking. Ask your underwriter. I need another four points on this. Yes, thank you for 15%. I need 19%. We want 19% on this. It's amazing what you get when you ask. I'm telling you. You can get whatever you ask for, for the most part. Now, you might not get everything you ask for, but you're probably going to get something, and maybe not on every account, but on a lot of accounts. Um, You can get more commission if you ask for it, right? So, for example, if you're getting 10% commission on it, and you ask for 11%, you're not getting 1% more. You're actually getting 10% more commission. Like, you're making 10% more on that account, if you will, because you're asking for an extra percent. Okay, very, very important. Same thing with surplus lines. Surplus lines agent, the wholesaler, they're keeping a percent. I don't like that. You know what? Um, Frankly, after all said and done, why not ask the surplus lines agent to give you all the commission and then they charge a fee for what they want? Why not? It's amazing what you get when you ask for. I mean, you have to do it on a case-by-case basis and not every time, but it's going to depend upon what's happening. You have to show the insured what's going on so they can either like say yes or no after all said and done, but you know what? Hashtag ask for the sale. You can do that. Ask for more commission. But you can also do fee-based products, potentially. Again, check your jurisdiction. But why not offer a social media campaign to all of your, your, um, your hospitality accounts or restaurant accounts or things like that? Why not you know, manage a social media form? Charge them a fee and actually do that, and you're also getting paid a commission on the actual placement of the policies. See, a lot of agencies do that. Mentioned in the past, but when I did have a general contractor as a client, um, we charged him about thirty some thousand dollars. I think it was thirty five thousand dollars a year to actually manage the certificate compliance program for his subcontractors. That was in addition to what we actually received on the insurance policies. I know of another agency that created a plan, um, um, a tech program to actually monitor certificates um, for when they come up on all of these storefront locations in shopping centers. And so they just made sure that there was glass coverage and it automatically sent out a reminder to update the certificate and have it sent in. Um, The agency was making well over a million dollars a year. Listen to me. The agency was making over a million dollars a year in different um, different real estate owners who were using that particular certificate compliance company, uh, that compliance service rather. Uh, That's just straight money to the bottom line of the agency. It's a great way in which also to begin prospecting. You get to talk to a lot of people who are interested in something that you have to offer. So, again, you know, 
Don't take this you know, as just a blanket statement. Definitely check with your agency personnel. Check with your attorney. Run it by your E&O insurance. Make sure that you're able to do it in your state. But there's no reason that you just have to make, um, you just can only make revenue from an insurance policy. You know, there's a lot of other things. I'm, one of the things I even um, suggest to some of my agents is that you create a, um, you create like a little mini association for different businesses. Why not have an association? If you're going after landscape contractors, why not create like a group or an association um, so that these landscape contractors come in and to be part of the association, like you offer particular services, maybe you help them, um, you know, find, um, you know, some of their equipment for cheaper. Maybe you get a 10% discount on blowers and, and lawnmowers and stuff like that. And, you know, the, the landscaper pays $250 a year for membership. And part of that, you know, association, if you will, is that you are the agent that actually helps them with insurance. They don't have to use you, but they could. $250 a year. How many different landscape contractors need to be a part of that association before you're actually making a significant amount? Probably not too many. See, the thing is, is that there's lots of opportunity out there. It's just a matter of which one would work best for you. Create fee-based products. The final one. This one isn't necessarily insurance-related. I think it's just wise entrepreneurship. It's smart business. This is good leadership. Accountability. What you need to do is start your own mastermind group. What I mean by this is, look, start a group... And these can certainly be with people in your own agency, but look, I'm, I'm not actually thinking of people maybe even in the insurance business. I'm thinking of starting your own mastermind group. You might think of it as a networking event. Great. That's fine. I'm really thinking more of just a leadership entrepreneurship group. Okay. Find an attorney and a CPA and a financial planner and different people like that who are hungry and trying to write business. And I'm not saying this is something that you refer one another to. I'm saying that you all talk about what you're working on and you hold one another accountable. And you also you you all talk about what you're what you're winning and what you're not winning and what you're doing and how you're going after new clients. And you push yourselves towards excellence. That's really what I'm talking about. Push yourself towards excellence. Certainly, it can be done with one or two other people in your agency. Definitely can be done that way. But I also think that it's good to have different people think about different things and tell you about how they're doing it in their own unique industry because it's going to give you creativity. You're going to be thinking outside of the box more. You're going to be thinking about different ways to actually become more successful because the way that maybe the law firm is doing something might be different than how your agency is doing something. And you might get a few nuggets of wisdom there or how the CPA is actually prospecting and finding new construction clients to become the CPA firm for, you might be thinking about different ways in which you can do that to become the insurance agent for those construction companies. Lots and lots of opportunity. Start your own mastermind group. And so, again, let me just summarize these for you. And you don't have to necessarily do all of them. Start with one. Start with one and work on it until it's done. And then you can then uh, take a bite out of another one. But you got to start somewhere. You li listen to me. You have to start somewhere. Otherwise, you're just playing the game of mediocrity. You're playing average. You're on cruise control. Step outside of the box a little bit and try one of these. Again, the the ebook that I wrote is called The Millionaire Producer. You can download it at www.millionaireinsuranceproducer.com. The subtitle of it is Seven Steps to the Fastest, Smartest, Most Ethical Approach to Building a $1 Million or More Book of Business. And these seven steps to becoming that millionaire producer are these. One, collect signatures and serve happiness. Two, licensed for persuasion, not sales. Three, think bigger. 12x, your mindset. Four, stop offering quotes to non-clients. Five, the riches are in the micro niches. Six, fee-based products, fee-based services, or simply ask the insurance carrier for more commission. 
Hashtag ask for the sale. It's amazing what you get when you ask for something. And then finally, that seventh one, start your own mastermind group or literally an accountability group that is going to push you towards excellence. You do those things and you are going to be well on your way to building a book of business. Focusing on the broker of record letters is indeed the fastest, smartest, most ethical approach to building a $1 million or more book of business. And hey, as I begin to end this out, listen, if you're enjoying this podcast, would you do me a favor? Would you please leave a review on iTunes or wherever you're actually listening to this thing, Stitcher and so forth, Apple? Would you please leave a review? I would appreciate it. It's going to help us in the algorithm to get this information out to some more people. I would really appreciate that so very much. Leave um, leave a great review. I would uh, appreciate that significantly. And hey, I hope you the best of luck in your prospecting. My name is Charles Specht. I am the host of the Millionaire Insurance Producer Podcast.